Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 14th Annual Dean's Diversity Forum. My name is Asia Bolton, and I'm a second year student at Widener Law Commonwealth and the current president of our Black Law Students Association. Balsa has worked all year long to keep the conversation of diversity alive in everything we did throughout my time as Balsa president. Specifically, we have held a town hall meeting with our Widener community about diversity and inclusion. We've held discussion panels with many diverse local attorneys and held some fun networking events centered around diversity. So I'm honored to be here with, to be here to welcome you all as you continue that conversation. With that said, I will now be introducing the Dean of Widener Law Commonwealth. Dean Michael J. Hussey is currently serving as Widener Commonwealth's interim Dean. Dean Hussey has previously served as the law school's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and co-director of the campus's business advising program, which he founded. Dean Hussey has also led the school's volunteer income tax assistance or VITA program for a number of years and the efforts of his VITA students have resulted in more than $4 million in tax refunds for mid-state families. Dean Hussey is on the United Way of the Capital Region's Board of Directors and is a former recipient of the Central Penn Business Journal's 40 Under 40 designation. As a professor, Dean Hussey also received Widener's Teacher of the Year Award. Dean Hussey graduated magna cum laude from the St. Louis University School of Law and has an LLM in taxation from Washington University School of Law. Thank you. Thank you, Asia. Welcome to all of you for the Dean's Diversity Forum and our great uh, discussion that we're going to have today. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce to you our guest and featured speaker today, Vincent Rougeau. Dean Rougeau currently serves as Dean of the Boston College Law School and is the current president of the American Association of Law Schools. During his 10 years as Dean at Boston College, he has led a reorganization in the leadership structure that supports a more holistic approach to student services, expands the school's recruitment of a diverse student body, and enhances the school's commitment to experiential and global learning. Indeed, thanks to Dean Rougeau's efforts, BC Law students today enjoy a greater opportunity to gain hands-on training as well as to gain legal experience in a host of settings around the globe, including Ireland, Germany, Chile, and France. In addition to his leadership responsibilities at the law school, Dean Rougeau also serves as the inaugural director of the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America, and as a senior fellow at the Center for Theology and Community in London. As an expert in Catholic social thought, his book, Christians in the American Empire, Faith and Citizenship in the New World Order, has been published by Oxford University Press. Dean Rougeau received his AB from Brown University and his JD from Harvard Law School, where he served as an articles editor of the Harvard Human Rights Journal. This summer, Dean Rougeau will become the first layperson to serve as president of the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. It is our great honor to have Dean Rougeau with us this afternoon. Dean Rougeau. Thank you so much, Dean Hussey. And uh, thanks to all of you. It's my great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wanna also offer my special thanks uh, to my colleague of many, many years, going back to when we were assistant professors together at Loyola University of Chicago, Dean Christian Johnson. and. Uh, a new colleague, uh, Professor Randy Lee. Uh, I'm very honored to have this time with you today to discuss the issue of anti-racism and racial justice. Given the historic nature of our recent presidential election, the violent insurrection at the Capitol in Washington, and the recent mass shootings, particularly the one in the Atlanta area, there's a lot to think about in the current life of our nation that engages this topic. And these events set an important context for much of what I will be discussing today. Now, as you all know, 
this country has gone through a dramatic reckoning around the issue of race over the last few years, particularly this past year, due in no small part to the tone and character of the political leadership that was in the White House. Former President Trump's rhetoric and what he chose to say in response to the killings of black people by the police and to protests for racial justice reopened wounds in American culture that many of us thought were healed or at the very least, we thought were further along in the healing process. But this reckoning cannot be laid at his feet alone. It has been a long time coming for political, economic and cultural reasons that seem to have come to a head during the stress of the current pandemic. Now, I should speak personally for a moment here, and I will do so again later in my remarks. Both of my parents who are around 80 years old were very involved in the civil rights movement in this country in the 1960s. While a college student in 1961, my father spent close to two months imprisoned in solitary confinement after organizing a sit-in at a lunch counter in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Shortly after that, my mother was the first black professional hired by a major hospital in Miami Beach, Florida. And when she gave birth to me in 1963, she was the first black woman to deliver a baby at the Catholic hospital in Miami Beach, a city in which black people were not allowed to live in the early 1960s. Despite those experiences and many others, both my parents have been shocked by the current level of racial animosity and the persistence of racial injustice in this country, particularly after all they endured in the hopes of moving this nation forward. Unfortunately, America's struggle with its racism is far from over and the quest for racial justice and racial healing remain with us as we move into a new presidential administration. What has changed with the new administration in Washington, however, is the climate around the conversation and the sense that the nation can now move forward. Our new vice president is a woman of color and is the child of immigrants from Africa and India. And the members of the cabinet represent a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. I know that for me, this is a powerful expression of what America at its best is all about, and it gives me hope. But racial animus and injustice is deeply ingrained in American culture, and we have seen that a certain kind of leader can engage that hate and ugliness, the dark side of the American character, as a way to capture and consolidate power. What we have endured is a tug of war between what America was and has been and what it is struggling to become and can be. So in my remarks today, I will do a few things. First, I wanna offer a definition and description of this concept of structural racism. And then I wanna explain how structural racism operates within the unique cultural, economic and political environment of the United States. And then finally, I wanna offer some ideas on how we might work together with greater urgency to continue to build something new in this country, a truly multiracial pluralist democracy that offers hope, dignity and meaningful citizenship to all by sharing some of my experiences with faith-based faith -based community organizing. Now I should say, I recognize the limits and failures of faith organizations in this context as well, but there also has been some remarkable racial justice work done around the world by faith leaders and institutions. And I wanted to share my experience with it. I think it offers some hopeful possibilities for the future. So let me start with two stories, one historical and one recent. So first, let me go back to a story about my mother. So in the suburban town outside of Boston in which we live, uh, there was a, there's a magazine that uh, features families and individuals from the town so that people can get to know one another better and people can hear more about their stories. Uh, and we were proud that my mother was featured recently in one of these stories. And she told some stories about her past um, that I didn't even know about. And one of those stories was about how she was named. So she was born in 1939 in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, and when she was 13, she wanted to get a social security card because she wanted to get a job. Well, when she applied for a social security card, they couldn't find her birth certificate. Um, 
she knew exactly where she was born, had been born, you know, her mother had everything, you know, the dates and all of the information, the place, but there was no record of uh, her name, Shirley Ann Small, uh, at that hospital, having been born on the date that she insisted that was her birthday. After some digging, they found that, well, actually there was someone named Betty Jean Small born um, at the hospital on that day. And with a little more digging, they determined that Betty Jean Small was actually my mother, but my mother had been named Shirley Ann by her parents. Well, it turned out that the nurse on duty at that time in the segregated ward of that hospital, uh, the white nurse treating the black patients, decided that she was going to name this child and put the name that she chose on the birth certificate and sent that to the state and to the federal government in term for record keeping. And it took 13 years for my mother to find out and she had to legally change her name so that uh, she could carry the name that her parents had given her. And, you know, I was of course shocked to hear the story when I heard it. And I'm sure a lot of people in my New England suburban town were even more shocked to hear it. And I'm sure a lot of you were shocked to hear it. But I think it's something that we have to remember that it wasn't that long ago that black people in this country could not even be sure that the choices they made for the names of their own children would be respected and would be honored in the way that you would think would just be automatic as a way of respecting someone's humanity. So with that story in mind, I wanna tell you another story about a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine from law school. Now this friend of mine is a conservative man. Uh, he's married and has two sons, a uh, white man. He was born and raised in the South, although he hasn't lived there since he was uh, 18. And we've been friends for over 30 years. Now we avoid talking about politics because our politics do differ. <laughs> uh, but we found some common ground based on a lot of other shared interests and shared commitments, including our faith commitments. And of course, a shared love and respect for one another. And we've always had a willingness to listen to each other. So recently we spent some time talking about the crisis around race and racial justice in the United States. And he was deeply concerned about the persistence of racism in American life. The murder of George Floyd disgusted him. And he was working hard to educate himself about racial justice and anti-racism. He really does want to be an ally. But in our conversations about race, he did something that a lot of white Americans of good faith tend to do. He, had a real, he has real trouble separating his per personal antipathy for racism from the reality of systemic racism that is baked into American culture and institutions. Acknowledging that he might be participating in and shoring up racist structures, despite his own personal rejection of racism was very difficult for him to do. In fact, the idea that he might be indirectly complicit in the persistence of racial injustice in this country made him angry. Since he was not a racist, in his mind, he could not be involved in institutions or practices that were racist. But our institutions, economy and government function based on the decisions that people make and have made. And it does not take much investigation to determine that many of those decisions were explicitly racist or were in service of various understandings of white supremacy. Now, he wouldn't be surprised about the story of, of what my mother experienced, particularly having grown up in the South. But he was shocked when I began to de detail how racist structures and assumptions have always affected my life, his peer, and the lives of my wife and children. He seemed deeply troubled by what I said. Because he loves me and he loves my family, it was very hard for him to reckon with the reality that I was born into a society that taught me from a very early age that my humanity was compromised because of my African ancestry. And many years later, the society has taught my children the same thing. Now, perhaps it has done so in less harsh ways, and it certainly has done so in less harsh ways for me than it had done and than it did for my parents. But rest assured, the message was received. So how does one reconcile the privileges of being white in a society that for almost all of its history has been virulently anti-Black? 
it's hard for people who aren't experiencing racism to see it in many instances. But George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and so many other videotaped killings this past year, not to mention the many, many others before that that were not filmed as proof, have sent a message. More and more people are beginning to understand that what the author Resma Menachem has uh, described in his book, My Grandmother's Hands. Americans of all races have internalized centuries of trauma from our nation's violent and racist past, a past that can trigger unconscious fight or flight reflexes at the sight of a body with dark skin. So indeed, as the off-quoted phrase from the author William Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun reminds us, quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Sometimes it reminds us of its presence by slapping us in the face. Americans have been forced to see that their personal goodwill, their individual changes of heart, are not enough to cleanse this society of hundreds of years of anti-Black racism. The poison tree continues to bear tainted fruit. This is why we need to acknowledge and understand structural racism. So what is structural racism? At least in the US context. So institutionalized or structural racism manifests itself both in material conditions and in access to power. So just to begin, I'll use a definition from the Aspen Institute. There are many great definitions out there. This is just one that uh, I thought would be helpful. Quote, structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group and inequity. It identifies dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. Structural racism is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it's been a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist. So let's take this definition and work with it a little in more detail. Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, a physician, epidemiologist, and anti-racism activist who's based in Atlanta at the Morehouse School of Medicine, and she, who recently spoke uh, at the Canal School of, of Nursing at Boston College as part of a programming, as part of a program, excuse me, that we've been doing on uh, racial justice throughout this past year through the forum of racial justice that you heard about in my bio. Uh, Dr. Jones has done some wonderful work using analogies to make the idea of structural racism more vivid, more clear. And she calls one of these analogies her gardener's analogy. And I think it's a great way to understand, another great way to understand what structural racism is. So I'm gonna share that with you now. So imagine that you had two large flower boxes on your front porch. And when the spring came, you decided to grow flowers in them. Perhaps you're, this is a new home for you. You're just arriving, these boxes are there. One of the boxes was empty, so you bought potting soil to fill it. Now you didn't do anything to the soil in the other box since it was full of soil and you assumed it was fine. Then you planted seeds from a, a single seed packet uh, in the two boxes. Now the seeds that were sown in the new potting soil quickly, quickly sprang up and flourished. All the seeds sprouted and the most vital among them were towering and strong. And even the weak seeds made it to a middling height. However, the seeds planted in the old soil did not fare so well, far fewer sprouted when even the strong seeds among them only grew to a middling height and the weak ones died. It turns out that the old soil was poor and rocky in contrast to the new potting soil, which was rich and fertile. And the difference in yield and appearance in the two flower boxes was a very vivid real life illustration of the importance of environment. So those of you who are gardeners can probably relate to this. If you don't know what you're working with, you will often find out too late when the, when the planting is done. Now let's imagine that you know one of the boxes has rich fertile soil and the other one has poor rocky soil. And you take two packets of seeds from the same type of flower. Now the plants that are grown uh, from one packet happen to be pink and those from the other happen to be red. You just happen to prefer red. So you plant the red seeds in the fertile soil and the pink in the poor. And sure enough, the red flowers flourish and the pink flowers struggle. 
Now in time, flowers will go to seed and they'll drop new seeds, they'll drop their progeny in the soil in which they're planted. And year after year, the red flowers are more vigorous and attractive and the pink flowers struggle and are weak. Some of them often die. And after many years, imagine that perhaps you forgot your intentional choice to put the red flowers in the better soil. And over time, having forgotten that, you conclude that, you know, I was always right to prefer red because the red flowers always look better. They were always much prettier. Now, the second part of the story illustrates some important aspects of how institutional, institutional or structural racism can work. There is an initial decision of separating the seeds into two different types of, store, of soil. So when we change this into a conversation about humans, about people in our own society, we can call that the decision to segregate, right? And one way to think about this is, is residential segregation. So let's think about how after World War II, when the United States government decided to invest a lot of money in providing housing for Americans, there was an active choice to segregate black people out of that help. Um, so a lot of places that were built like the Levitt towns um, up and down the East Coast um, were intentionally segregated. Black people couldn't live there. Um, so intentional segregation. Now, next you have the contemporary structural uh, factors of the flower boxes, which keep the soil separate and reinforce that segregation. So in my earlier example now of, of residential segregation in Levittown, residential segregation becomes the accepted norm. All nice areas are segregated, right? White people don't live with black people um, and the government doesn't allow uh, communities that are integrated really the same access to lending that they do to communities that are segregated. And this gets into redlining, which I'm sure you've heard about and is another big conversation we could have. Um, but over time, people forget, right, how these things happen and they just start to see them and accept them as part of the landscape, right? And assume there's nothing that can really be done about it. And that's the final piece, right? You have the act of omission in not addressing the differences between the soils over the years. So in our flower example, you haven't, you've just accepted the fact that the, the flowers are different because you haven't done anything to augment the soil in the weaker flower box. And in our residential segregation example, this results of this segregation start to just appear to be the normal order of things. Indeed, your assumption that the red flowers are intrinsically better than the pink has contributed to a blindness between the difference of the differences in the soil and actually the normative aspects of institutional racism are illustrated by your initial preference for red over pink, your initial preference of white over black, which in the United States, we can say goes back to these historical decisions that have sprung from the enslavement of Africans and have then constantly re-manifested themselves in different choices that were made that are all linked to the notion of white being better, black being, being worse. Um, and so it produces these poison fruits, as I said, like racial housing segregation, the wealth gap now that exists between whites and blacks in this country because of the inability for so many decades, so many generations of black people to even get their foot on the bottom rung of the ladder in some of these places to buy property and build that wealth. Again, one example among many. So, in the United States, an early choice was made by those in power to prefer white skin over dark skin. And this is often traced to decisions in the English colonies like Virginia to racialize slavery and dehumanize enslaved people in an effort to keep Africans and indentured European servants from joining forces against wealthy plantation owners uh, who were in course, of course much smaller in number. And over time, a racial binary was created in which people were either white or black with black people being either property as slaves or debased and marginalized, despite perhaps being technically free in a legal sense with few or any rights. Now, these racial distinctions hardened in the United States when Southern states began to pass laws making it virtually impossible for anyone with traceable African ancestry to escape the category of black and all of the indignities and inhumanities associated with that assignment. And an important manifestation was the legal defi definition of race that was colloquially called the one drop rule. 
One drop of African blood made a person black and meant you would spend your life in the poor, rocky soil. This history has created something akin to a caste system similar to what exists in India in the United States. And I would highly recommend Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste, to those of you who have not read it, that dives more deeply into this argument. Black people have lived at best as second class, a second class or a shadow existence in the United States for most of the country's history. When slavery ended, formerly enslaved people were quickly segregated into ghettos and separate institutions. Again, the poor rocky soil. That segregation was legally sanctioned until the 1950s and 60s. And where it wasn't legally sanctioned, it was a de facto reality. But even when the laws changed, the cultural preference for whiteness and the multi-generational effects of structural racism and racial trauma remained and often went unaddressed. The culture had internalized the idea that the red flowers were better than the pink ones. So we're only now beginning to take a serious look at the structural issues that centuries of racism have created in this society. But there are still many people who deny them, refuse to see them, or assume that socially constructed racial categories and hierarchies are objectively true based on what they observe around them. If the outcomes for black and brown people are poor, it's not because they've been planted for generations in poor rocky soil, it's because they are unable to perform at the level of white people, intellectually inferior, lazy, more physical, more emotional, more sexual, more violent. As the scholar Ibram Kendi has noted, American society needs to become anti-racist. In other words, the preference for whiteness or the negative associations with blackness, those things are so pervasive that we must actively engage in challenging that assumption everywhere, all the time. We need to ask why outcomes are so different and why people of color routinely bear the brunt of the worst features of American society, the violence, the poor healthcare, the environmental degradation, food insecurity, educational inequality, COVID-19, et cetera. The pursuit of racial justice means that we no longer stand silent in the face of glaring inequalities that are not products of nature or demonstrations of racial differences, but the results of deliberate choices that have deepened and magnified over time. So how do we move forward? Well, I know all of us will spend some time thinking about that today, but I wanted to offer something from my personal experience to help get us started. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about faith-based community organizing in my experience. And most faith traditions teach us that all people have an inherent God-given dignity, and we are called to honor that dignity in our lives as people of faith. This is the example I think that drives so many religious organizations to welcome and support immigrants and refugees, for example, and to provide support to the poor and the marginalized. Again. I don't deny the places where these organizations have fallen short, but uh, for these purposes, I wanna focus, focus on some things they've done well. Over the past 10 years, I've been proud to be involved with a colleague and friend in faith-based community organizing work, faith-based community organizing work in London through the Center for Theology and Community, which has brought together immigrants and refugees from around the world in partnership with London's white working class, trade unions, churches, and mosques. These disparate groups have found unity around shared issues of concern, economic marginalization, crime in their neighborhoods, better educational opportunities for their children. And what we've discovered in this work is that human beings actually have a remarkable ability to build relationships across difference. And when efforts are made to encourage relationships, they will form coalitions around issues of shared concern. This doesn't mean that the differences will disappear or that in some cases they're not meaningful, but the more successful the cooperations, the more manageable the differences seem to become. People find ways to compromise and to see humanity in one another because they value the benefits of working and living together in peace and in respect. Pope Francis had a recent uh, book that uh, called Let Us Dream. It's called Building Solidarity and Fraternity. And in a recent opinion piece in the New York Times, he exhorted all of us to dare to create something new. As the coronavirus pandemic reached new heights, he challenged us to reject a populist politics that works to exploit our fears in order to assert power over society. Far from seeking to promote the common good, this populism has fueled a selfishness driven by a distorted ideology of personal freedom. 
if it's not already obvious, coronavirus has unmasked, unmasked the true nature of the populism of the far right. And as Pope Francis observed, it's neither acts in the interest of ordinary citizens nor develops their agency. Rather, it, quote, reduces the people to a faceless mass it claims to represent. It's a fake populism, for power remains with members of the very plutocratic elites this ide ideology claims to despise. And in the face of this populism, Francis warns, we must not simply hanker for the status quo. A soulless technocratic liberalism has created a soil in which this destructive populism has germinated. Its conceptions of liberty and equality have become untethered from fraternity and a vision of a true common good. In this post-COVID world, neither of these alternatives are going to suffice. Only a politics rooted in the people, open to the people's own organization, will be able to change our future. Again, another quote from, from Pope Francis. Now in the United States, this breakdown, breakdown in fraternity and lack of concern for the common good recently brought the nation to the brink of a cataclysmic political crisis. For the first time in modern history, an American president who had lost an election was exhorting his supporters to reject the act, despite the voting certified as free and fair by members of his own political party and administration. It was primarily due to the extraordinary courage and commitment to democratic values of relatively unknown Republican officials at the local level that this crisis was averted. Surely our descent into increasingly hostile political divisions has taught us that neither the state nor the market can generate the fraternity we need. So if we can commit to working to eliminate the structural harms that in some cases our economy, but certainly that racism has produced in this country, I think we can see real, a real flourishing of solidarity, fraternity, and community. Racist structures harm all of us. Economic inequality inhibits the flourishing of our economy. Healthcare disparities rob us, of physically vital, rob us of a physically vital population and become a costly drain on our healthcare system. Other examples from around the world teach us what can be accomplished when a nation improves and expands educational opportunities for all. The strength of America has always been in its openness to new citizens and to, and to diversity. We cannot abandon that. I believe our current reckoning around racial justice is a chance for us to make this nation better and stronger. And I'm very encouraged by the multiracial, multi-ethnic and multi-faith commitment of so many to realize a new vision for our nation's future. So I look forward to a deeper conversation with all of you and hearing your ideas today uh, about, about these important issues. Thank you again for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak with you. It's a real honor. And looking forward to our conversation, as I said, going forward. Thanks again. Thank you, Dean Joe, very much um, for th those remarks and for getting our uh, conversation started here today. Certainly you have given us a lot to um, work with this afternoon. Um, now, just a little um, to set the order here a little bit, I will um, introduce our three panelists. They will each have uh, eight to 10 minutes to um, give us their um, initial comments and any reactions they may have to Dean Rougeau's remarks. Um, and then following that, we'll open it up for a little bit more of the full discussion. So questions from all of you and maybe a little more interaction between the panelists and Dean Rougeau himself as we go through this. Uh, our first panelist is Iva Farrell. She is um, an associate professor of legal methods at Wider University at our sister law school in Delaware, Delaware Law School, and serves as co-director of Delaware Law School's trial admissions program. From 2016 to 2018, she served as Wider University's chief diversity officer. Professor Farrell received her BA from the University of Delaware her MBA from Rutgers and her JD from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Before moving into academia, Professor Farrell practiced business and intellectual property law at Pepper Hamilton LLP and Morgan Lewis LLC, both in Philadelphia. Our next panelist is the Honorable Royce Morris. 
And among his many accomplishments, I think the most prestigious one is that he is currently Widener Law Commonwealth's jurist in residence. So we're delighted to have him in that role this year. Um, since 2017, he has also been um, on the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas. And prior to his election to the bench, he was a shareholder at Goldman Catsburg um, in Harrisburg, where he focused his practice in municipal law as well as in civil and criminal litigation in both federal and state courts. Judge Morris also has served our legal community, including a term as president of the Pennsylvania Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. He worked on the Pennsylvania Bar Association's committee tasked with making recommendations on revisions to the Code of Judicial Conduct and was four years on um, a committee on the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing. In addition, he has chaired the Dauphin County Bar Association's Equal Professional Opportunity Committee for seven years. Judge Morris is also deeply involved in the community. He continues to serve on the board of directors for the Harrisburg Police, Police Athletic Association and volunteers in many of their activities. He has served as a Cub Master and coached many youth sports teams. Joseph Robinson, our third panelist, has served and has served um, as the Executive Director of the Martin Luther King Leadership Development Institute for the past 12 years. Based in the greater Harrisburg area, the Institute aims to provide people with leadership tools and resources to improve themselves and their community, regardless of age, race, gender, or religious beliefs. Mr. Robinson's own professional career has found him assuming leadership positions in public, private, and nonprofit uh, spheres. He is the author of the book, Seven Leadership Imperatives from a Wild Man, a Leadership Life Gleaned from the Life of John the Baptist. Mr. Robinson graduated from the University of Virginia and currently serves as a deacon at his church, the Greater Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So welcome to all of our panelists. We are delighted that you are here with us. And let us begin with Professor Farrell. Well, thank you so much, Dean Hussey, for that introduction, and thank you so much to uh, the, the organizers for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I also want to say how excited I am to be here with uh, Dean Rougeau as well. Uh, I had many things to say, but I want to get to the conversation, <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat some of the things I was going to say. I have actually been touched on already, so I won't, uh, I won't speak on those, but one of the things that I, I do want to uh, want to talk about really is just how this topic is certainly it, it's it's timely and a lot of it it would be difficult to wrap our hands around this topic I think at any time uh, and it may feel even cliche to say that right um, but but it's it from my vantage point it feels apt right to say that this is a difficult uh, topic to dive, dive into um, but the notion of structural racism, and the idea of proceeding towards some sort of, of racial justice is an ideal, right? It, it is still an ideal. Uh, and in many ways, it's a dream, right? It's a dream and it's a dream that is accessible, but it's still a dream in the way that it was a dream when Martin Luther King described it as a dream oh so many years ago, right? Um, but one of the things I think in order for us to seek justice in this area, there's no way to, to there's no way to move around the idea that we have to have all hands on deck, right? And so I think Dean Rougeau touched on that when we're talking about this idea that there has to be collaborative effort, right? There's going to have to be collaborative effort in order for us to be able to proceed towards some notion of achieving racial uh, racial justice in this country. Um, one, if history is our guide and we look back at the movements of the civil rights era, uh, Dean Rougeau spoke about his parents uh, in the 60s, you know, ha all hands came together, right? When you look at what was going on in the civil rights and, you know, the ride alongs, the freedom riders, you had a meshing of cultures going on, and that is by no means 
to suggest that this was not, the heavy lifting wasn't going on from the black and brown folks in that movement. But you did have those cultures going together. And the reason I bring this up is because if you look at what's going on today, and if you look at what has just happened over the last couple of years, the Black Lives Matter movement and many of the movements for social justice in the wake of the oh so many deaths that we've seen and we've now had captured on film, you saw a joining together of cultures and people like you haven't seen in many years. And so I think that that's important to recognize. But I also bring it up because what we've seen of late in the wake of what just happened in Atlanta and what we've seen of late with the attacks, the unprecedented attacks, and I say unprecedented only because it's now very visible and people are paying attention to those persons in the AAPI community, right? People are paying attention. I won't touch my screen. I won't share slides right now as I normally would do because I'm terrified because Zoom had so many issues yesterday. Um, but clearly hate is on the rise, right? And I don't say that to, to, to make this a downer. I say it because people will need to be unified in that notion and all hands will have to be on deck to fight it. So from my perspective, this is not going to only be a religious, you won't just have to have to fight this from the religious perspective, from social perspective, but this, we'll need a political solution and political will as well. So what, why do I need that? What we've seen lately, we saw like no other, if you just look at Georgia, we'll use Georgia because that is the, the example that everyone is so, so familiar with. In Georgia, you saw someone like Stacey Abrams and she was not alone, so many people, right? You saw, what happens when people are confident that when they exercise their right to vote, when they exercise their franchise, when they do what we tell them that democracy was designed to do, they got to see the fruits of those efforts. What we also saw was that when we saw that access to the ballot enabled them to make something happen, we saw peril on the other side people realize that, oh, wait, this actually does work. <laughs> they actually believe that democracy works. So we've got to find a way to shut this down. And I don't want to make this political, but what I do want to say is that education is super important. We know that. And now we know that education about people's civic opportunities and availability of those opportunities is important as well. And, and also making sure that people know it's not just the presidential election. Because what you see now is the Voting Rights Act and all of those rights that our parents and our grandparents fought for so many years ago, they're in trouble again. And it's a very real peril. So when I spoke a moment ago about the dream, right, and the ideals that we're striving for and that we need all of those hands on deck for, we have to fight very vigorously to protect all of these things that we want to have happen. You won't be able to ensure that you have this pluralistic and racially just society if you don't have in place all of the framework that we have said means so much to us. So that's just a couple of things that I was thinking about. So you have to think about um, if our government is a representative democracy. And if we're looking for a truly multiracial, pluralistic democracy, as was described earlier, then we have to ensure that everyone has the franchise and that they are able to exercise it. So I think that one way to ensure that we keep that dream alive is that we've got to protect the vote. We've got to make sure that people are exercised, that people are educated about that, and we can't allow uh, that to be destroyed, right? So that's one thing that I think is is really important. I'd like to talk some more, uh, some more about that. I think also we want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that we have support for that, and we want to make sure that we build bridges between these communities. For so many years here in in our beloved country, uh, there has been an effort to keep many of the persons in the BIPOC communities estranged. Because as long as they were estranged, they couldn't build those coalitions. They couldn't stand together and realize the commonality of their 
experiences. A lot has been written, a lot has been discussed about the fact that, well, different races, different experiences, model minorities versus uh, the dirge of society, all of these different things, the experience is common. And in addition, the experience is common between their Caucasian brothers and sisters as well. And so that's one of the things that when you look at a campaign like the Poor People's Campaign, it's economic. It's socioeconomic, right? There are a lot of things that people need to be educated about to understand that when you're looking for common ground, those are the conversations that you need to start having in order to move things forward, in order to build those connections. Because as long as we continue to try to estrange people, then we're going to not be able to move toward that ideal. We're going to continue to move in the wrong direction. So I'll stop talking now because I'll have lots more uh, to say later, but those are just a few of the points that I Oh, I do have one more, one more point. I do want to add uh, something that Dean Rougeau said, because you mentioned about your mother's name and that she didn't know her name for 13 years. Literally last Thursday, I was talking to a friend of mine who was born in 1969 just outside of Washington, DC. We were teasing her about having her name misspelled on Zoom. And why did she have her name misspelled on Zoom? And we were teasing her about the fact that in college, she spelled it one way, and why does she have it spelled this way? And she told us that was because she didn't know how, what, how her name was spelled into a certain year. And she said, back then, the nurses filled everything out. No one, so it wasn't even just in the 30s, indeed, 30 years later, depending on where you were born, right, you may have had even less control over, not to the same degree, I agree. But, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's, it lingered far longer than we even know. And there are plenty of people who, you know, live in these types of, of situations. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak, but I will move the conversation along now. Thank you, Professor Farrell. I'm sure we'll have a, a lot of time here um, when the conversation uh, really gets going. So Judge Morris, we're coming to you for your um, initial remarks, comments, and reactions. Well, I, I too would like to say uh, thank you. I want to say thank you to Asia Bolton as well uh, as a former uh, boss of president myself. Uh, thank you to Dean Hussey and uh, Dean Rajot. Uh, I really appreciate you coming and uh, I gleaned a lot from uh, what you discussed with us earlier. And so I, I just wanna start by telling a, a story about back in 2013, I was asked to speak at Messiah College, which is a, which is a local Christian college. Uh, and it was at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. And these young Christians on this campus were struggling with this issue of Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. And it was really causing a controversy on that campus because of their faith, but also their struggle with what was going on in the Black Lives Matter movement at the time and this pushback that all lives matter. And so I, I made a decision uh, that I was going to present uh, a very raw uh, presentation uh, just to highlight what I thought was driving this Black Lives Matter movement in light of the murders that happened back in 2013. Uh, and so I found uh, out of the book Without Sanctuary, which is a pictorial of lynchings, uh, one of the most gruesome lynchings uh, that you could see. It was a, a body of a man hung and burned, his genitals cut off, uh, his legs and arms cut off as well. And in the picture were adults of all ages and children, some as young as two and three years old in the picture. Uh, and I intentionally hid that photograph from them. And I read to them uh, the, the strange fruit uh, poem, which uh, was turned into a song uh, by Billie Holiday originally by Billie Holiday, I believe some others have sung it as well, uh, Nina Simone, I believe as well. But uh, I, I read those lyrics to them, and then I began talking to them about the fact that you can't look at Black Lives Matter uh, just based on 
the murder that happened last week to a black man at the hands of police. And you have to put it in a historical context and you have to look at the history of it. And when I pulled the curtain down on that picture, there were some audible gasps when they saw that picture. And, and I tried to begin a discussion on, this is the historical context under which African-Americans, black people see these police related brutality incidents. And if you don't understand the lens then you can't understand what's going on. But then the more I, I thought about it, and this was after I did that presentation uh, and I, I learned about uh, trauma, I read uh, Joy DeGruy's uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome uh, and, and that also enlightened me. And I began to realize that, you know, the trauma of that time on black folks also created trauma on white folks, trauma that they yet have not recognized. And to be a, to be a, a toddler and to see another human being lynched, murdered, burned, testicles cut off, pieces of his flesh sent to family members uh, as a tribute, postcards made of the incident sent around the country the trauma that that created on the white body was a trauma that uh, I think we, we don't really recognize has framed some of the, the frustration and tension uh, in the races being able to work together to get past the structural racism situation that we find ourselves. And, and people like uh, Resma Menekin that you've discussed, uh, Dean Rajot, are people who are starting to, to, to deal with this and understanding of the trauma. And I think in order for us to, to sort of tackle this structural racism, both white and black have to begin to understand that there is a history of trauma. One of the things that uh, Joy DeGruy mentions uh, and, and quite skillfully in, in her book is, you know, we hear about uh, when someone comes back from war we hear about PTSD uh, and we, we, we hear about how they need to be treated. They were in war and they were in battles and you know, they have this trauma. They saw their best buddy you know, sawn in asunder you know, in some major battle. And so we need to treat that as a mental health condition. And we need to treat that so that they can get past that trauma. Well, after the enslavement of African-Americans, they were released. And they had been in trauma uh, their entire lives. They had seen mothers raped uh, by slave masters. Uh, men had been in the bed with their wives and had their wives snatched out of the bed from them uh, and, and were powerless and could do nothing. Children sold away, uh, children killed, uh, killed in the fields, men's backs broken uh, with the heavy labor and then just hit over the head with a mallet because they were no more good. I mean, so, so those traumas occurred and did we hear that anybody was ever treated for those mental health conditions that obviously came out of that trauma? No, there was no treatment. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I know that trauma is generational and is passed down and there are many theories that prove that. And so we have to get to these underlying traumas, not only for, for black folks, but for white folks. And, and the denial of the, the real history of America, I think has kept us from dealing with that trauma. Uh, and, and I think I'll, I'll sort of end my initial remarks. I, I, was, I was, had the benefit of being at Temple University uh, when Malef Malefi Asante started their African-American studies program there. And he, uh, started talking about Afrocentricity and, and sort of language liberation. And, and so, you know, I, I, I started viewing slaves, not as slaves, but as the enslaved and understanding that that individual was, you know, whatever his name was on the continent was who he, who he truly was. Uh, and Malefi Asante talked about saline consciousness. Uh, Wal, Wal Soyenka was a, a South African uh, writer who talked about that Africa doesn't end where the salt water licks the shores of, of the coast, but Africa is wherever Africans are. And, and I think that sort of framed my perspective on, you know, how I view myself as a black man, but 
I think a lot of uh, black folks are disconnected from who they really are. Uh, and, and that disconnection has also frustrated our abilities to move forward. But what, what, I, what I want to sort of say um, in terms of, you know, getting our white allies to understand is that the, the very founders of this country understood uh, Thomas Jefferson, the, the one quote that they attribute to him from his notes to the state of Virginia in 1781, where he said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. He was referring to slavery. And if you read the notes further, he goes on to say the whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part and the degrading submission on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it for man is an imitative animal. So Thomas Jefferson understood generational trauma and he trembled for his nation that he knew that what they were doing, what they were engaged in was creating some of the same problems that we see still with us today. Uh, so, you know, I offer that as my initial comment uh, and I, you know, welcome uh, this discussion. It's a difficult uh, task uh, to tackle, but I just got done reading Uncomfortable Conversations with the Black Man by Emmanuel Acho. So we need to have these uncomfortable conversations and we need to address them head on. And, you know, mince, the time for mincing words, I think, is over. Uh, we're at a point now where we should speak freely and openly uh, with our allies and uh, with our enemies uh, so that they understand and we can frame the perspective that we need to come from to move forward. Thank you, Thank Judge you. Morris. Um, now let's come to Mr. Robinson. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Hussey. And allow me to be here today and uh, thank grateful for my panelists, Dr. Farrell and Judge Morris. It's an honor to be uh, among those two individuals. Um, Dean Rojo, I thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, so, so apropos, and we thank you for that, for, for lending us your time. I, I, I just so, I, I know Dr. Dr. Uh, Farrell already mentioned about her friend in Washington, D.C. Just let me tell you, just so you know, your mother's experience, she wasn't a unicorn. My mother was born in Chester, South Carolina in 1932. And uh, like your mother, uh, her name also, her name is Doretha. Uh, she's passed away two years ago. Her name was Doretha. However, her birth certificate, we later found out later in life, uh, actually said her name was Caroline. And that was because the midwife Maybe she couldn't spell Doretha, so she went with Caroline. I don't know. Uh, uh, my aunt, my mother's sister, was named Cleaster. And again, it's an unusual name, but the midwife wrote Fanny. And on, on the, uh, so, so to illustrate your point, and, and also to reinforce what you're saying, because I don't want the others on the, on the call who may not have had a shared experience to think that that's such an anomaly, you know, that that was common practice uh, for, uh, in terms of uh, this misnaming of African Americans. Um, I uh, like to draw from, from history as we all have done, and, and I've heard some comments. You know, uh, it, was, it was Harry S. Truman, President Truman said, the only thing new in this world is the history you don't know. And so everything just repeats itself. And I, and I, 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 I was listening to the comment about uh, 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 about uh, this, this the, the Black Lives Matter. I want to talk about that. But before that, uh, Professor uh, Rojo, uh, if you just let me to expound just a half a second on on your comment about Levittown. And I know you know all the history. It's just the time doesn't permit us to go into great detail. But for the benefit of those who are on the call who may not know the history, you need to know when he said that Blacks weren't allowed, you need to understand that they're mortgage contracts had language that said you cannot sell your property to a person of color even if you decide to move out of levittown what 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 we also know is that those homes financed by the government 
providing loans, those homes at the time were worth $8,000. These were cookie cutter homes. It gave birth to what we call the suburbs. One story homes with, a, with an attic and a TV all came in one package. The home was worth $8,000. The, 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 the white soldier who was able to partake of the GI Bill purchased that $8,000 home for $400. Today, those homes are worth $400,000. And so you look at the generational wealth that we missed out on. And so it's important that we understand that history. And again, I don't say this in a, in a pedantic way for, for you, Dr. Rizzo, you get this. I'm saying for the benefit of maybe some others who are younger than me who may not know that history. So that's why I went to that detail, uh, just to put a little more on that. Uh, you know, Dr. King in his book, in pre preparing for today, I, I, I revisited his book, Where Do We Go From Here? His landmark book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Um, and one of the things he talked about uh, during his day, one of the uh, prevailing arguments was with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, Stokely Carmichael and Company. And they wanted to uh, advance the notion of black power. And uh, Dr. King uh, had some uh, objections to that because he thought it would alienate some people. Uh, but but he went on to to say, in 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 discussing it, he he said three things that I think are appropriate today because if you substitute Black Lives Matter with Black Power, that expression, if if we're going to modernize it today, you would see Dr. King's three observations. I think are still apropos. He says, it's first necessary to understand that black power is a cry of disappointment. And that could be the same could be held, can be said of uh, Black Lives Matter. Because as he said, disappointment produces despair and despair produces bitterness. So he said, it's first and foremost, a cry of disappointment. And secondly, black power or Black Lives Matters is a is a, an appeal to amass the political and economic strength to achieve legitimate goals and then thirdly he said black power or black lives matter is a psychological call to personhood he said manhood but it's person personhood a psychological call because of the trauma that royce judge morris spoke of because of the trauma uh, that, that he spoke of. And, and, and so when we think about the fact that our educational system, the fact that so many of us, and I mean, we don't know, the, uh, many of us don't even know the history of Levittown, but the fact that so many of us weren't even told those kinds of things, it, it, it did a disservice to all of us. It gave, it gave, it gave uh, all these, these, these tropes that have been passed down for years provide gave black people an unhealthy sense of inferiority and then conversely it gave white people an abnormal sense of superiority and so everybody suffered and so we've got to uh figure out a way to to move from there and that's what this conversation is about today i i, I know um um this is a uh an opportunity for us to have these conversations. And as Royce pointed out, white people have to play a critical role in this because uh, black people did not create these systemic uh, stereotypes, okay? And, and systemic uh, racial structures that Dr. Rojo talked about. And so white people have to help dismantle those. And so, this is not a time for sitting on the sidelines. And so I'm excited. I heard what Dr. Farrell said that people all over the world now are jumping in now. And uh, uh, particularly in light of the uh, uh, George Floyd incident in particular, that seemed to that seemed to be like the Emmett Till moment of, the, of, 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 of our era or something, because now everybody's finally uh, woke, if you will, and have finally seen uh, uh, how, how our system has played out and dis and disparately affected African African Americans, uh, and so I would say later on I'll say a little bit more about the institute and and what we're doing to try and and bring about uh, some some change. But I must say 
that when I looked at the title of today's uh, message that they talked about uh, faith in the future, I, 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 I first I questioned well, whose faith and then uh, who, who, who is whose faith and then America's ongoing quest to build a diverse democracy. Uh, I, I, I often I often said I wonder is it, is it also America's quest to to resist democracy because it wasn't until uh, uh, until this George Floyd that we that we as black people sought an indication that America is ready to embrace so we got a glimpse of it but we need only look at the, the halls of Congress and again as Professor Farrell said not trying to be political we only need to look at the hall of Congress to see that not all of America is yet ready to uh, build this diverse democracy, but yet we we don't despair. We continue to press forward, but it's gonna take all of us working together. Uh, white folks who've become enlightened have to now be courageous and stand with us and speak truth to power. And so that's where, that's where we find ourselves. And so I'm gonna stop here because I know there are a lot of people Thank, thank you to all those 95 people that signed up here today, because I know you have a lot to say and we want to hear from you in the time that remains. So thank you for allowing me to make those opening statements. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson, for um, your remarks and, and furthering this conversation. So our process um, for the rest of our time together um, will be that if any of um, those of us um, on the call have questions or comments or to engage in the discussion with the panelists. If you want to um, send any questions you might have to me in the chat, I will um, ask those of our panelists and we'll keep our um, conversation going on that. Um, I'd like to throw out, to start things off, to throw out um, one uh, question um, for anyone in the group that they would like to ask. Uh, to answer, uh, to get this going a little bit. And it's about um, thinking about what both uh, Professor Farrell and Judge Morris um, spoke about in their remarks. And Professor Farrell had talked in, as did Dean Rougeau about, um, maybe not quite the same language, but about finding common ground. And so um, Professor Farrell had talked some about that um, as it related to the socioeconomic part. And then Judge Morris had talked about um, Black Lives Matters, um, uh, you know, contrast it with All Lives Matter and some of that context. And so, um, you know, how do we look for that common ground without losing uh, uh, sight of or losing what, you know, makes the, the Black Lives Matter part of this very much different? And so to, you know, not wanting to say, I'll just throw it out there. I'll see if anybody has any reaction to that. Well, I think that's I think that that's a great question, and I think it's the question that comes up again and again. Um, you know, our university has a uh, a common ground initiative, right? And I think that one of the important things about it, it's fine to seek common ground, but you're exactly right. You cannot dilute the original conversation, and so I think common ground means that. First, you have to listen to the other side. It doesn't mean that you talk over the other side. It doesn't mean that you have to force the other side to your position. It just means that you agree to hear them. With respect to the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter uh, you know, discussion, I think that in many instances, people have to agree to disagree. Um, with respect to when, when most of the time or many times with the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter discussion, people will view it as, well, someone says Black Lives Matter, and then the sign goes up next to it, All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. Well, most people view that as an affront to the Black Lives. It's, you, you cannot value the Black Lives Matter alone. You have to then say, well, it's the other. It's not to the exclusion. Just valuing Black life doesn't mean that you don't value the others. It's an, it is an affirmative statement to merely say, I acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. And so I think that for many people for whom that statement was important or for people making that statement, to, to actually hear that statement was they wanted affirmation that you would stand with them. I think the other issue um, here when you're talking about common ground, um, it's just, again, 
you have to be willing to hear, right? You have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to dialogue. I do just want to say uh, one thing, and this is this relates back to Judge Morris's point about trauma. Trauma is real. Right. And I know that's the understatement of the millennium, I think. Um, I presented on, on trauma a couple of months ago, but there's a lot of research now about how this trauma is, you know, it's epigenetically transferred, right? It is in our, it's not actually a DNA change, but it is passing through our bodies generationally, right? We are carrying it. It is not leaving. And so I think that COVID and being in the time of COVID, this idea, because we were all suffering, we were alone, we were home, we were, whatever was happening, people are starting to finally take a minute and look at trauma and look at the fact that, hey, there's some other stuff going, it's not just PTSD from being in war, right? And people are actually beginning to acknowledge that there can be suffering based on other things. So I think that that's the other point, acknowledging that people can be going through some things and it's okay that it's not about you, right? You can let someone else, it doesn't mean that they're a victim. It doesn't mean that you're giving them some special status, but you can acknowledge their personhood, their humanity, right? And let them have their walk, let them have their day. So I think in terms of common ground, just to, just to restate, you have to acknowledge someone's humanity. You have to acknowledge that everyone has dignity and you know, not everyone is going to say, hey, we're all equal. Hey, we're all brothers. Hey, I agree with what you're saying, but you have to give them the floor. You have to give them their opportunity. So I. Think so what would be an example of that acknowledgement of their humanity? I mean, what would that look like in practice or interaction with individuals? So I think that if, if you're just dialoguing, I'll use an example of a conversation with it with let's, let's use students, okay? Um, let's say you're in a law class and you are having a conversation about you know, Fourth Amendment due process, okay? And you're discussing a case and uh, the case is talking about a person of color who has been, uh, you know, who's been arrested and there's only one person of color in the room and someone makes an offhanded remark about how you know oh well, well it's always them right you know or something that that is that is off color etc the person in the classroom may or may not be affected by that right if there's a conversation afterwards hey you know i i would like to talk to you about this that's an opportunity for dialogue that's an opportunity for them to talk about the fact that, you know, this is a case. This is how I felt about this. This is how the system works. This is structural racism. This is right, opening up that conversation. That person, just as we talked about people not knowing about Levittown, that person may not have been exposed to the realities of those systems, right? So it's so that's an example. It's not it's not the best example, but that's an example about opening up dialogue. I think that um, Judge Morris mentioned it. Not everyone has been exposed to everything, but that's no excuse for not allowing yourself to get educated mm -hmm. or to speaking about. It. I put something in the chat earlier about we cannot shy away from having these conversations for fear of upsetting someone or for fear of stepping on people's toes because we'll be back where we were pre, you know, two years ago or whatever the time, pick a time, right, in the past. Mm -hmm. You have to name this, which is why you look at Ibrahim uh, Kennedy's uh, piece and all of the other wonderful mm -hmm. writers that are there. We have to talk about anti-racist practices. We have to talk about privilege that exists. And it's not just white privilege, right? There are different kinds of privilege that exists there. We, you know, whether it's intellectual privilege, whatever it is, we have to acknowledge that these things exist, but you have to name it and you have to discuss it and finding common ground, that's a place where you, where you can do that. Okay. So one of our, and I'll throw this out to anybody that wants it. Uh, one of our attendees asked, how do you find common ground when, uh, 
folks have very different facts and there's a lot of a disagreement about just where we are on all of uh, that. So, you know, textbooks in different parts of the country will have different facts and disagreement about that. How does that affect how we get to that common ground? What can we do to lead us to a place where we're working from um, the, that same set of facts so that we can talk about what to do with them? Dean Rougeau, I see you unmuted yourself. Well, I was just thinking about this in the context of what I, I do as an educator with those of us who teach who are faculty do um, in our roles. Um, but also I think in terms of how a country claims certain truths about itself that are necessary if the nation is going to cohere. Here's an example. You know, you don't get to deny the Holocaust in Germany. It is not something that can enter into public conversation and there are actually laws that, you know, make it, you know, a crime in certain instances to, you know, pretend that that did not happen or to claim that that, that did not happen or to try to assert, uh, you know, counterfactually that somehow that was a lie. Um, now, there may be nuances around, you know, what occurred, but, um, you know, that country has a responsibility to the world to make it clear to everyone that something horrible happened in their name and it needs to be, you know, acknowledged and named itself. And the act of trying to undermine it or, or undo it is itself something that cannot be tolerated. And what we don't do in this country, to my, in my view, is we allow for often the losers of arguments we've had about the nature of our shared history to continue to claim, you know, an alternative view of the facts. I mean, how many times has this nation coddled southern versions of, this, of the history of, of the Civil War, of Reconstruction? Uh, how, do we, how often do we continue? to allow, we've we, you know, released the South from voting rights obligations, for instance, and what happens? They go back to their old behavior patterns uh, in certain parts of the country. And I know I'm not meaning to pick just on the South in this instance, but it's a, a very obvious example. So, you know, we have to demand as a nation, those of us and our allies who are having these kinds of conversations that it's just not going to uh, be, um, we're just not gonna tolerate, you know, these alternative versions of the facts, uh, at least in our public life. Uh, how we do it? Well, we could have a long conversation about that, but other countries have managed, you know, through truth and reconciliation processes, through laws, through other things to end divisive conversations about what happened in the past when they know what happened and they know for the country to move forward, that conversation needs to end and they have to accept a certain understanding of the truth. Yeah, I, I'll chime in there. I was, uh, I have, a, uh, my family has a house in Virginia and I was at the Northampton County Courthouse yesterday to uh, get some paperwork uh, for some remodeling on the home. Uh, and uh, in front of the courthouse is a small Confederate monument. Uh, and in the monument, it, you know, attest to the bravery of the men uh, and how the men fought for the rights of the state of Virginia uh, and uh, the people of Virginia and the Eastern shore of Virginia uh, in some very flowery terms. Uh, and black folks walk into that courthouse each and every day and pass that monument uh, and uh, there is a, a location there that uh, the black folks used to be able to go swimming uh, because they couldn't swim on the public beach in Cape Charles, Virginia. They would swim uh, and the area is called Pickett's Harbor. Uh, Pickett was a Confederate general uh, who, uh, you know, lost in Pickett's charge and was not a very successful general at all. Uh, he lost almost every major battle that he was in, but there's a place named after this Confederate general, and it wasn't named after him until 1913, 
Uh, so it wasn't named after him right after his valor or the lack thereof. Uh, it was named uh, shortly thereafter to, to sort of mark territory for the Confederacy that was no longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we, we, when we're talking about history and, you know, whose truth is the truth, uh, you know, I don't really want to get hung up in that. The, the truths that I want to get hung up in is the fact that the, the Constitution, this, the framing of this country, the words that were spoken, that all men are created equal, the promise of America. We talk about the faith that we have in America. Well, in my Bible, it says faith without works is dead. Uh, and America for too long has had this dead faith in the institutions that our framers created. Because if they believed in the promise of what those documents say, then they would be willing to move towards this more perfect union, as we say. But I believe that that is sort of our, our rallying point. If, if you believe, uh, and Dean Rojo, I, I believe that, you know, you're doing this type of work and, and you're, you're heading in a great direction with it. But if they believe in, in that system that we've put together, this country has put together, they have faith in the system, then it may make you open your ears. The, the, the insurrection at the Capitol, uh, you know, had to wake people up that if we believe that our framers put things in place that are, are for the betterment of the union of this nation, then we should follow those things and not allow ourselves to be waylaid into something that is totally uh, the antithesis of what our government was designed to do. We've accepted now that we need to move in a direction where we, we bring everybody in under this umbrella uh, that we call America. That's what it was founded on. You, you, you can't deny the fact that even though the framers at the time didn't want to include women, didn't want to include blacks, didn't want to include Native Americans, that they drafted a document that included all of those people when it plays out to its truest form. Uh, so I think that's where we can start. That's where we have commonality. Uh, you know, those people that were waving those American flags, they believe in America. Well, read a little closely, a little more closely, what those founding principles were all about and embrace those founding principles. And then you'd be less likely to uh, do the types of things that we've seen done to people of color, uh, to our, our, our Asian brothers and sisters, to, to all those marginalized groups, if they understood and in, truly embraced uh, our constitutional principles. Uh, and, and finally, I wanna say this about uh, you know, the, the, I believe that one of the greatest driving forces, as it was in the civil rights movement, can be the faith-based community. Uh, but I think that there needs to be some repentance <laughs> because they have allowed uh, the, the, and I'm not going to call out any denominational uh, issues here, but I think some in the faith-based community have allowed one issue, uh, one principle, one mm -hmm. uh, part of the gospel <laughs> to, to drive their understanding of how you love people and, you know, and, and, and how you embrace people. And, you know, we know, uh, those of us who are Christians know that, you know, Jesus Christ went to everybody. And, you know, he was not just a, a man who walked amongst people who look like him and, and was willing to only extend a hand to people who look like him. So I think we need some repentance from the uh, faith-based community on uh, the, their most recent uh, stray, <laughs> straying from the path. <laughs> I'll put it that way. All right. Excellent. And, and I'll just chime in very quickly with just one comment because I know we probably have other questions. Um, I, my, 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 my point is, and you say, how do we get to this common ground? How do we have these conversations? But, well, well pe people have to be willing to put themselves out there and have these tough conversations with people of color. And so it, it, rather than 
uh, going to the conversation, you have to you have to approach that conversation. First of all, you have to be willing to go speak to somebody of color and try to get an understanding. But then you have to d deploy Stephen Covey's habit number five. He says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So if you enter into that conversation, you can't go there with your preconceived notions of what is truth and what is the truth. You go there seeking to understand, go there recognizing that God gifted you with two ears and one mouth, go there seeking to understand. That's how we begin the process of, of getting some understanding and, and, and healing, if you will, but, it's, but it starts there. So, 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 so you might say, well, black people need to understand me too. That is true. But in this case, we're talking about racial, uh, uh, race, racial, uh, hatred or racial animus, we're talking about that. So in that case, it's not the black folks, so it's white America who's done it to black people. Okay, we get that. A accept it, embrace it, it is what it is. But now how do we move from there? Well, you move from there by putting yourself out there and engaging people of color in these hard conversations and engage them with an open mind to try and really understand. That's the key. Is, is trying to understand, may not agree, but try to understand. Empathy goes a long way with, with anybody. And that's all, that's, all, that's my comment for now because I know time is pressing. Sure, well, thank you for that. Um, and I'm um, trying to put a couple of things here. We have a few that have um, a theme running through them um, and they kind of, you know, the, the theme running through a few of these questions deals uh, with a broader question. Um, you know, what can uh, law students and lawyers in particular do? So there's a question about, uh, you know, stemming the tide of voter suppression. Um, you know, another question about um, talking about racial justice with the emphasis on the justice part of that, you know, sounds like it has to come from the law and the legal system, which tends to uh, be more reactionary than proactive often um, in doing that. And so, um, you know, what needs to happen among lawyers and law students and law schools um, to move forward? I'm not a lawyer, so I'll let the lawyers answer, but I'll just add this layman's perspective. Uh, I think Widener does a great job with turning out good lawyers, and it just baffles you when people come through good law schools, how then when they get into the public sphere can just forget all about what they learned and just become so, uh, just become so uh, partisan in their interpretation of the law. That just astounds me. So, so I don't know if the law schools, uh, uh, if it starts there with, 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 with cautioning against that kind of behavior, but uh, but but that's just an observation from a layperson. But I'm going to defer to the to the legalists here uh, in the profession to answer that question. Well, I guess I'll start as a dean. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, there are a number of things that need to change, um, and I guess I'll start with things we can change as in terms of how we educate new lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. And there's been a, to my, in my view, a very positive focus in recent years in legal education on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I think is unpacking some assumptions we had mm -hmm. about how you train lawyers. And one of the things that was traditionally done in law school was that, you know, you try to create a lawyer who's you know, so objective and so disconnected from the realities of their social situation, their political I mean, situation, their economic, and in an effort to, you know, create this sense of impartiality, you can represent any client. Um, and yes, to some extent, it's important to be able to recognize your role as a player in a system that needs to provide access to legal representation to all people. And that makes certain assumptions about guilt and innocence and, um, and also recognizing that many, many people don't have access to lawyers and that sometimes the unpopular client is the one that most needs representation. Those are all good things. But what we've also done in, in our education is often 
not been sufficiently attentive to the kinds of things we've been talking about today. Uh, and we have damaged the learning mm -hmm. of a lot of people who come to law school with some of the realities of structural racism, of intergenerational trauma, of um, you know, various types of di discrimination, economic marginalization. And we haven't really provided good spaces in our teaching and learning for them to, to deal with that and engage it and bring it into the conversation mm -hmm. uh, in ways that will allow us to send lawyers into the community who have been formed with a more realistic understanding of the society in which they are operating. So we have formed many lawyers in an image of you know, a kind of idealized, impartial, you know, white male of a certain generation and time, um, you know, who is acting as almost sort of in a noblesse oblige kind of way, like a, mm -hmm. I will render justice mm -hmm. uh, from my impartial space. Um, and in a, you know, in a different time, in a different culture, that might have worked, but it's not going to work now, uh, and it's not the kind of society we live in. And so, uh, I think every law school has to think really carefully about what kind of student body am I bringing in? Am I really bringing students from across the range of social uh, uh, situations in this country? And when I'm getting them, when I bring them into my school, are we having honest conversations about race, about class, about marginalization, about gender? Um, Yes, those are difficult conversations and we are still figuring out how to do them well. But if we don't, I mean, lawyers of all people in this society in which we live in a constitutional democracy um, that is you know, driven by the rule of law, uh, if the lawyers that we create are not sensitive to these issues, then we're not gonna be doing justice. Um, you know, we're not really going to be uh, representing and recognizing the realities of the society in a way that will help to produce the kind of democracy we hope to have. So, um, so that would be one thing I would offer from the perspective of law schools, you know, really being focused on, you know, what kinds of communities of learning and formation we are creating in our law schools. Yeah, I would absolutely echo uh, what Dean Rougeau uh, just said. That is wh what he said about bringing in students, training in, training students, absolutely true. And think about how that percolates up. We need those people on the bench, right? If we're ultimately going to mete out justice, we need those, those students who have been trained in that stead on the bench. Um, the other thing that's been interesting just in the last few years, universities are doing really great work undergraduate institutions are doing great work, much better work than law schools are doing. And so you have students who are trickling into the law school environment who are ahead of the curve, right? It, and they expect to be engaging in these conversations. They expect to be doing this kind of work and they expect the school to be responsive. Another thing that's interesting is we also have a lot of young scholars in the legal academy who are moving into the social justice space. So what I suspect is that you're going to see a lot more scholarship clearly in this area. And so you'll see, you'll start to see more of that, um, you know, energizing, I hope, um, you know, the law school space as well. I mean, I, my, my prayer is that, you know, we are moving, as I said, I said, ideal, I said, hope uh, that we're, we're, we're not going to turn back, right? We're going to continue to press forward. Um, and we have to do that by keeping it in front of us naming it, not being afraid to, to speak about it and not, you know, and not stepping back. One of the things that when I, when I talk to students about this kind of, of work is just that, especially when students want to have those kinds of conversations. One, I tell students that they cannot expect to have BIPOC students, other BIPOC students, other BIPOC people to be the leaders of the conversation. They can't engage in trauma porn. They can't expect those people to always be the sharers, right? They have to be willing to do some of the educating on their own, right? They've got to come and do, you know, do some of the work um, as well. And so I think that generating that interest, taking that interest, taking some initiative, um, but for the school to provide that space, one, you know, I, I'm not. I know that you have the center uh, at BC. That's that's a wonderful thing. I think schools need to do more of that, right? And creating common common readers just to get the language and the concepts in front of schools. Because the other thing is, um, what's also happening is that some of the law firms are out. We're outpacing the academies as well. Corporations were doing a much better job 
than firms were doing. Corporate spaces were already um, getting very engaged in DEI work. And so now you see many of the firms getting uh, CDOs in place, making sure that their, uh, that their uh, attorneys are trained, et cetera. So I think that it, it's sort of an you know, all at the same time, things are springing up. And I think that the emergency situation in the field, so to speak, uh, is, is causing the alarm bell to, to ring and, and things are happening. So um, I don't know that it, it's still a little bit more ad hoc than it is, um, you know, than it, than it is, uh, you know, perfectly, uh, you know, coordinated effort. But I do think that it's on the radar of most schools, most progressive deans, like a you know a, a dean Rujo. and so I think that you'll see more people, uh, you know, the students being trained and coming through and asking for it, quite frankly. And I do know I, I, I'm not a member of the bar here in another jurisdiction. They're doing training now, making sure that that's part of some bars, making sure that that's part of the ethics component uh, is DEI work. So um, you know that's another thing that you know again. It wasn't their choice two years ago, but you know, it's like, it's the hot new ticket, whether it, morally that's the thing that they wanna do, they recognize that it's the thing that they better do. So um, you know, that's just another uh, a way to look at it. Thank you. Um, so in, in talking about um, this, I mean, we've had, um, I think I'll phrase the question this way. We've had a, a few questions that um, I think are go in this direction as well. So, uh, so how do we keep uh, the the momentum going? So, I mean, there were some questions that were asking, um, you know, about Black Lives Matters, um, and for your thoughts on that, and and defining, you know, that movement and trying to keep focus there with that. Uh, I know when. Um, in Dean Rougeau's remarks, he had talked about um, that the last um, really uh, year, maybe a little longer, you know, really revealed the, uh, the, the lack of progress that was made. And if anybody, uh, you know, had thought somehow we had gotten past um, a lot of these issues, it showed that they were still there and that um, those deep wounds had not healed and kind of bringing it back thinking, you know, and a lot of you were talking about, um, you know, uh, you know, experiences and through the sixties and Dean Rougeau again talked about his parents and all that they endured in that time. But I, I'm curious on your thoughts, you know, on going forward, you know, what's the, uh, you know, what should we be focused on? What is that part of the mission? Um, how do we, um, keep the energy there that's been generated, the awareness that's been generated, particularly in the last year, so that, you know, 50 years from now, we're not having um, the same or only a slight variation of the same conversation. Well, uh, and I'm sorry to jump in again. I, these last few days, especially um, with what just happened in, um, in, in Georgia, I have been increasingly uh, preoccupied with the, just the violence in and against that community. And one of the things that and I've been talking to some friends and, and colleagues, what I, what I envision and what I think, I, I, this is not gonna the tide turning, but I think that the increased energy that is going to come out of that community and the spotlight of issues of racism and, um, and, and hate crimes and things that are happening against that particular community, I think that they will help to amplify the issue in a way that, and I'm gonna say this, merely anti-Blackness is not always enough but their ability to now pull out the megaphone and moving out of, um, out of the model minority status, but hey, pay attention to this too. Just in the last couple of days, there's been a lot of discussion um, about even, we talk about affinity and uh, I can't remember who mentioned it earlier, someone mentioned earlier, and actually it may have been a different conversation. When you talk about people of color, where it's not, no group is a monolithic group, 
right? And so now you're even seeing a discussion of this is violence against East, East Asians versus this is not a Southeast Asian issue versus, right? They are highlighting the importance of paying attention to people of color of all stripes. So I think that there's a heightened sense and so they want people to be educated and know. If you look at the Pew Research data from right before this happened, the majority of Americans agreed that there was racism against pretty much all people of color. Highest against, uh, against African-Americans and Blacks, next against Latinos. There was some against Asians, but they were the lowest on the rung. It will be interesting to see what that number looks like when they repeat these numbers. But what I think in terms of energy, I think the increased voices, and that goes back to my conversation earlier about the linking hands, right? So if you analogize this to the, uh, you know, the Poor People's Campaign and Reverend Barber and, and his work and what he does in, in North Carolina, and, you know, and again, the, the, you know, the, the Catholic Social Justice Movement and how they join in, in lots of, of these things as well. And certainly Dean Mujo can speak much more eloquently uh, about that. But if you compare that to the movements of, you know, the 60s and you look at the work of, of Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., it was the same kind of thing. And so one, you know, once he started to organize Blacks and, and poor whites together, right, soon he was assassinated. So not to be a conspiracy theorist, right, but connection is what we need, right? And so I think that that will help to amplify, that will help to keep this moving in the right direction. But I think I put it in the chat before, we who are concerned, we who are interested, we who are seekers of social justice have to be the ones and the students who are interested have to keep it, have to keep the voice on, have to keep the pressure on, have to continue to program, have to continue to talk about it. That doesn't mean that you're out marching with a placard, right? It means do the part that you can. It means play the role that you can, right? It means don't work against it, right? It means you play whatever your role is. Everyone can't be an activist, but you don't have to be a drag on the movement either, right? So that's, hmm. that's my thought. That's it. I, uh, <clears throat> one thing that I said earlier that I talk about the Institute a little bit, uh, one of the things that we, we do certainly uh, in the introduction, thank, thank you, Dean uh, Hussey, you talked about the, the, the ecumenical uh, approach that we take at, at the Institute, people of all stripes. We have in our classes, we have uh, people with GEDs and PhDs in the room at the same time. Uh, uh, black, white, Asian, atheist, Jew, doesn't matter. Uh, we're trying to create Dr. King's beloved community. And so in that class, we, we talk about these kinds of issues. Uh, just, just Morris uh, uh, plays a pivotal role in our law and justice panel, where we engage the, the, the participants in these kinds of conversations. Um, but not only that, in addition to that cohort that we run every year, uh, we also, uh, for the last year, the Institute has partnered with Leadership Harrisburg. Leadership Harrisburg is run by a, a, a very long time, 15 year friend of mine, a white female named Una Martone. The Institute is run by me, a slightly older black male. And so you, we have this, uh, we, together, we have been going around for the last year conducting diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, one hour lunch and learns or, or, or sessions for different corporations, organizations, institutions uh, upon request, and and we train probably, uh, 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 we train probably, eleven hundred people in our community, where we've introduced to them this notion of DEI, from all walks of our community, and so that's what we're doing, to try and uh, uh, move the ball forward. Is having these conversations, and that's the only way it's going to be resolved. We have to keep having these co uh, conversations. Uh, and so we, we've created a forum where we can keep this conversation alive so it do, that it doesn't die. And I'm just thankful that people are still expressing interest. Um, even, even this afternoon got a request from one of our local op, uh, optical surgeon practices. They would like to, us to come in and uh, talk to their staff 
about it. And so that's one of the practical things that, that we're doing uh, to try and uh, keep this conversation going and, and move the needle. And they do an excellent job. I, I, I just like to chime in that, uh, you know, w words really do matter. And, and we've seen that over uh, the past several years, how uh, the rhetoric uh, can drive people to places that some of them, quite frankly, don't want to go. But uh, if they feel like someone with a, a title and a voice uh, is saying these things, that it, it, it is something that they should follow. Uh, and just like negative and, and, and vile rhetoric can stir, so can positive rhetoric. And, and we need to keep in mind that our, our children are watching and, and, and more importantly, they're listening. Uh, they're listening to the, to the things that we do and the things that we say. Uh, and you know, for anyone who's an ally, uh, for anyone who believes that you know, people, regardless of their, their religion, their color, their, their national origin, their sexuality, uh, people who believe that every living, breathing human being deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. If your mouth is not on that, use some African-American colloquialism there. If you don't put your mouth on it, then it doesn't matter. You got to put your mouth on it. You got to say it. You got to express it. You've got to You've got to demonstrate it. Uh, it's one thing to go to work every day uh, in a prison uh, or, or in a place where you find yourself surrounded by people of color sometimes that you don't particularly like uh, and you, you bite your lip while you're there. But when you go home, you call them all kinds of names uh, and your children hear that and they begin to internalize that. So the words really do matter. Uh, and so you can work in an institution that says it's for certain things, but if you don't put your mouth on it, if you don't put your words on it, then you might as well not even be there. And, and I think, you know, at being in, the, in the, the justice system myself, you know, we, we are trained uh, most recently uh, at nauseum on, you know, dealing with our implicit biases. Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and most of you that are professionals, you, you, you've begun to deal with implicit bias and identifying your implicit biases and, and, and working through those implicit biases. But the, the general population, they're expressing their biases and they're not trying to hide those uh, uh, in a lot of areas. Uh, and so we need to mind our tongues more, I think, uh, when we say we're an ally, when we say we're, we're for something, uh, the words really do matter. Uh, and, and so, you know, my, my hope is that, you know, out of this movement, uh, which I saw, you know, people of all races, all colors, all creeds uh, coming together to protest what was in essence a modern day lynching uh, with uh, George Floyd, uh, when, you know, there was a camera ready shot with a, with a police officer uh, kneeling on the neck of a, of a man for over eight minutes. Uh, and it reminded me of the, the picture that I showed to that class at Messiah College. Uh, and so when we begin to, to uh, deal with those types of things, I think the rhetoric has to continue. And people say, well, it's just words. Uh, words matter. Uh, you know, anytime somebody says, look, my, my black child is just as worthy as your white child, uh, somebody may internalize that. Some white child might say, yeah, what's the difference between me and Johnny? There is no difference. Johnny and I play ball together. Uh, and if they internalize that, that's all we want to happen so that the next generation doesn't uh, perpetuate some of the same things that we've seen uh, throughout history. So what's, I'll just ask a little more directly on that. I mean, what's the conversation that you would suggest parents have with their children? Well, you know, children are very perceptive. You know, ask, well, what do you think about Jimmy? What do you notice about Jimmy? Well, Jimmy's black. Well, what do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, and you'll be able to pick up what they've picked up from you about those racial <laughs> issues. Uh, and, and, you know, 
And then you can start the conversation. You know, maybe, maybe I said some things that you misinterpreted, or maybe I said some things, I meant those at the time, but now this is what I've learned and this is how I've developed. Um, you know, those are difficult conversations to have, but as, as, a, as a black man, I've had to have the conversation with my sons uh, about the police and about interactions uh, in the world in general, it wrapped in their black skin. Uh, and, you know, those are, those are not easy conversations. So the conversation that you would have with your son or daughter as a white person about where do you, where do you see yourself in this, in this world as it, as it relates to your fellow <laughs> citizens of this world? Uh, and those aren't easy conversations to have, but uh, they'll say a little bit about you as well. Uh, and, and I think that's the difficult dinner table conversation that I think a lot of people have had over the past, you know, six months to a year. Um, and, and I think it's a conversation that needs to continue. Uh, you know, uh, you, you may have, and God forbid, you, you may have the next uh, person in your home who, you know, decides to go into, a, a, you know, Emmanuel church and shoot up the church. Uh, because they've developed on the internet these racial, uh, you know, uh, things that are just driving them to want to kill Black people. Uh, and if you don't have the conversation, you'll, you'll never be able to deal with the issue. Uh, so, you know, silence uh, is, is not appropriate at this moment we find ourselves in. Thank you, Judge. So here we're, we're getting toward the end of our time and throughout all of this, um, all of you have been mentioning a lot of good reading and resources um, and things that have informed your opinion on this. So I thought we would go around with our group here one time and give all of you an opportunity to identify one or two things, books um, that you think would be good for people to read or that have influenced you um, or brought um, more insight to you on these particular issues. And then maybe, um, you know, just a, a few sentences or something on why you're making that um, recommendation and, and what folks might expect to get out of that. So Dean Rougeau, we'll start with you. I think I know what your first one's going to be, but. <laughs> well, um, I mentioned Isabel Wilkerson in my talk, and I actually think that book for me was really a game changer because it introduced something into the conversation about race in this country that has never really been part of it uh, by creating uh, a continuum around uh, the, you know, centuries old tradition of creating a group of people in society who are designed to be the bottom um, and you know who are designed to bear all of the the negativity that the society has uh, you know within its structure I think is really helpful and it's and it's difficult to read and there are obviously some differences between the United States and India but the other country that she includes in her analysis is Germany under the Nazis. And so when you start thinking about what's gone on in this country in that context, uh, and you know, I think it really opens your eyes to uh, you know, what we need to do to move forward. I mean, how important it is to break out of, of some of the traps set for ourselves. So that's one, Isabel Wilkerson. Um, I just finished um, the uh, Rasma Menachem book about uh, in my grandmother, my grandmother's hands about racial trauma, uh, and actually we're doing a program at BC on it uh, today uh, after this one. <laughs> but um, I actually think that's another great book because it really talks about a lot of things that we've already discussed about the sort of how our bodies are affected and this intergenerational passing down of um, you know the the fear the violence, the hate, uh, and some of it is, it, it's not within our control. We have to actually stop and recognize that a lot of our responses um, are, you know, from our reptilian brain, as he says, 
and you know because it's just been going on for so long so how do we break that cycle as well so those would be two i think great thank you professor farrell you're still muted there for us I was looking for the title because he, of course, picked Cast, and I and I have to say <laughs> Cast anyway, um, because Cast was probably the most impactful book of 2020 uh, for me, and 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 Cast was a very, I have to say, it was a very heavy book for the reasons that uh, uh, Dean Rougeau described. I had a friend of mine. I ordered it and then put it down. I ordered it and put it down. I started it and I said, I can't read this during, but it is a book that I think everyone needs to, to read because no, it's not identical, but it does frame, it does frame this life that uh, we've lived in a way that you wouldn't think about it. So cast would be number one. Um, I think that one of the books that I often suggest to people, and this goes back to a hundred years ago, uh, would be also um, would be Mind Bugs, right? So I would suggest that book uh, as well. Before that, um, I think how to be an anti-racist. If, if folks want something to do, if you want something practical, if you and this gets back to not asking people to uh, to share their trauma, but also practical steps about it's not enough just not to be uh, not to, to be a good person. It's not enough just to be not prejudiced. You have to actively work to not be a racist, and you have to start that from infancy, right? And so uh, in the book, he talks about how to actively work toward that end, right? And so how to be an anti-racist would be one that I think is very accessible and I suggest uh, for folks to grab if they want that. He has another book that talks about 400 years um, of, of racism. I'm gonna butcher the title, but that's another book that, that's very interesting uh, to read, but yeah, how to be an anti-racist. Great. Thank you. Judge um, Morris. Oh, oh, Mr. Robinson. Oh, go right ahead. So sorry. M Mr. Robinson? I forgot the rules of engagement. Forgive no, me. Go right, go right ahead. Go no, right no. ahead, Mr. Robinson. Okay. Because okay. well, no, Royce, Royce is the erudite one in this in this duo here. So I want him to go to talk. But 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 the book uh and it's 10 years old, but it's still a good book if you haven't read it. And that's Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. That's a book that that needs to be read. And then, and then the the thing that I, that an older piece that I uh, encourage everybody to read is uh, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail. I push that. That is that is something that should be read every year. You ought to take our time to read that letter. It takes about thirty to forty minutes to read it, but but it will be such a riveting piece of document because it will lay out for anyone uh, the the rationale. Uh, behind the movement and what he was trying to do and his rationale and, and how he approached it. And there's some good practical information in that letter from a Birmingham jail. And, the, and, and in fact, one of the things that, that's in that letter is he, he gives a strategy for mobilizing and, and how to go about it. He broke it down into four basic steps. He said, first of all, you have to collect the facts to determine whether injustice is in is in fact alive, and then you have to go into a negotiation phase with with the, with the, with the, with the, with, the, with the with the power broker, if you will, or the or the antagonist. You have to go into negotiation, and then uh, then you uh, we all know that after you negotiate, eventually you may have to go to some kind of direct action. Okay, well that's point number four. He contends before you go to direct action, you have to make sure you do point number three, which is self purification where you ask yourself, am I prepared to go the long haul here? Am I prepared to endure uh, a, 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 an abuse, a blow to the head or whatever? Am I prepared to pay the cost for what I contend is this injustice? So collect the fact to be sure that you in fact have identified the, 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 the offense, that you negotiate with those who have, who have the ability to change it, that you then go into self-purification and then direct action. And the purpose of direct action has one goal, that's to drive the negotiators back to the table now that you've gotten their attention. 
so that you can get something done. That's the strategy. You don't just march to be marching. You march with a purpose. You march with some of that work going on behind the scenes where you've tried to engage people. You give them an opportunity to do the right thing. And now you have to now to go public to put some pressure on them to come back to the table. That's his strategy. And he lays it out so beautifully in this letter. So, so those are my two recommendations, Michelle Alexander and the letter from a Birmingham jail. Read it every year. I try to make it a practice. Great. Judge Morris? Uh, yeah, I just got done reading Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man mm -hmm. by Emmanuel Acho. And, you know, it's just the, it's, a, it's an easy read and it deals with topics that are now in the, in the media it's written in 2020. It's written in COVID uh, times. So it, it's a very good read uh, for what's going on now. Uh, I mentioned earlier post-traumatic slave syndrome by Joy DeGruy. Uh, I think that that's a, a, a good place to start understanding trauma as, it's, as it affects uh, Black folks in this country uh, and it sort of opens you up to the to the trauma dialogue that is, is furthered in some of the other books that were discussed. Uh, and I agree, uh, I, I've read uh, Cast and I've read uh, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, and all of those are, are great books to read. I've read Michelle Alexander. Uh, and, and so here's what I'd leave with the law students on the call, if there are any still left, uh, to just be mindful of the fact that your legal education is not where your education should stop when it right. comes to these issues. That's right. You should continue to keep educating yourselves. And the reason why these books are being collected and, and these topics are being bantied around is because uh, these very educated people on this panel, uh, which I, I very much respect uh, their time and, and uh, what they put into this, uh, have not only develop their legal education, or their legal knowledge, but they develop their knowledge of the world and, and how they fit in the world. And so for law students, that's an important part for you to carry on uh, your mission as a lawyer uh, in this world is, is to educate yourself beyond the books at uh, Widener Commonwealth Law School, which I'm sure have tremendously helped you with your legal education, but beyond those. Thank you all for that. Um, I'd like to turn it, I know we're a couple of minutes over here, but I'd like to turn it over uh, to Professor Christian Johnson, our former Dean for a moment or two. Terrific, and thanks to um, Dean Rougeau for just a terrific uh, opportunity. We know he's given up a lot to be here with us. Uh, the law school wanted to provide an appropriate acknowledgement of how much we appreciate Dean Rougeau speaking today. The law school will be making a $1,500 donation in the name of Dean Rougeau to the Nativity Middle School located here in Harrisburg. In Harrisburg, uh, many of our alumni from the law school uh, that have been involved with BALSA leadership, and some of whom are attending today, have been active in supporting the Nativity Middle School. Uh, we honor and appreciate their commitment the Nativity School is a privately run, non-denominational, faith-based preparatory middle school aiming to break the cycle of the poverty for low-income inner city boys. The school provides a comprehensive middle school education and continuing support throughout high school and college. And we'll be making that donation as soon as possible. And we thank you so much, Dean Rougeau, for joining us today. Thank you, Christian. And so thank you to all of you for attending today. Thank you to Dean Rougeau, Professor Farrell, Judge Morris, Mr. Robinson for um, all of their insights, this discussion that we've had. And thank you all for your questions. This is certainly a very important issue and, and a conversation that needs to continue happening so that um, we can continue to make progress and get that progress to stick. So thank you to all of you. I look forward to seeing you soon.